So I've got one, I have a, a little bit of a limerick, a little bit of a, a short joke that you can share with anyone. This, this goes right down to the first grade. Did you hear about the skeleton that walked into the bar and ordered a beer and a mop? <laughs> okay, all right. You can use that. You can use that. You can use it somewhere. Oh, who's getting the special? That special chair for me? For the pad? So today, you know, today what I'd like to share with you, and good evening, cable, or good, good morning to whomever the cable viewers are, and you're up awfully early. I mean, it's only 10.30, you're probably just rolling in. You know, that's why you're still up. That, you know, we're here to talk about the, the most successful, the most memorable, First Lady, and that's Eleanor Roosevelt, and and presidential historians when they when they talk about First Ladies, they typically and it's Eleanor Roosevelt, the top three, it's Eleanor Roosevelt, Abigail Adams, and then Lady Bird Johnson, and that works for me. I mean, I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt raised the bar. No one is going to get is going to get over the bar raised by Eleanor Roosevelt, and. And the only issue I, I have here is that when she got agitated, her, her favorite expletive was the S word. And she said it all the time. And it was O spinach. <laughs> so, so that's how squeaky clean she is. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt was born in October 1884, and she was to the manor born. The, the, these are the, the, the the dynasties, the, the, the people that Edith Wharton, you know, wrote about, you know, the 400 families, and their marriage, I mean, her, her dad's marriage to Elliot, her father was Elliot, and her mother, a beauty, both, both, they were, this was a dynastic couple. Uh, her mother, her mother Sarah, absolutely a, a cotillion queen, and to the, you know, to, to the manor born, and to, you know, tragedy came quickly to you know to Eleanor. The her, she was daddy's little girl. She really was. Mother, mother never really bonded with Eleanor. Mother was distant. You know, mother was just mother was so attractive. You know, mother was so beautiful. And mother had her social friends and 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 Eleanor's and Eleanor Roosevelt's grandmother. You know, who will raise Eleanor as a as a young lady that. I can't believe, she would say this to her, I can't believe my daughter, you know, had you as a child. You know, and, uh, and, and refer to her as granny. You know, why don't you smile? Why don't you look people in the eye? Why, why do you always walk about with your head down? And she had those buck teeth, didn't she? You know, she had those protru protruding teeth. But if you look at her early photographs, beautiful young girl with that long flowing blonde hair that you know bunched up on on her shoulders she loved her father Elliot and as and as you know as she always would tell her her dad I love everyone and everyone loves me and then tragedy began to affect her life at an early age and by the age of eight by the age of nine she was living you know with, with grandmother Hall father Elliot Elliot, good-looking fellow, but he played too hard, he drank too much, and he, he, he always felt inadequate to his younger brothers. And eventually he played polo all the time, and he, I was saving that seat for you. <laughs> that's, what hero, that's what heroes do, I had my coffee. <laughs> thank, but thank you for asking, unless you put some, anything in it? <laughs> it's not too early for that. You know, just to pick it up a little bit. A little Zambuca helps a cup of coffee. So, so her, her dad, her Theodore Roosevelt, the oldest, you know, the oldest brother, you know, had Elliot, you know, with the approval of mother, his his wife, you know, committed to an asylum to, to to sober him up. And what had happened is that he, as I said, he played too hard, and he broke his leg. He got thrown from his horse. He broke his leg. It didn't heal properly. It had to be rebroken, and he fell into he fell into a deep drug dependency on laudanum. Now you cannot buy laudanum over the counter anymore. You used to. 
and it's a toxic combination of sherry, aspirin, and, and cocaine. Mm -hmm. That's a painkiller, mm -hmm. but it's also addictive. And he also had a, a drinking habit. He could put away two bottles of scotch or whiskey a day. He felt inadequate. I, I can't measure up to my older brothers, and certainly you know, to my father, you know, that all of New York just adored as a philanthropist. And so he fell into the drinking, and it got worse and worse. And, and one day, and she, she would correspond as best she could by letter with her father, who, who was healing. He was healing. He was in the hospital, you know, with little kids. Mm -hmm. And when, when father died, she was told he was thrown from a carriage mm -hmm. and broke his neck. Not true. He threw himself, Elliot threw himself out of a third story window. Mm -hmm. And he died of a broken neck. He just threw himself or fell out of a window. You don't tell the youngster that. And within, within two years, her mother died of diphtheria, her father, a carriage accident, and her brother John had died. And she went into a very deep depression that all of my significant others have left my life in, in, in less than 24 months. And she went to live with, as I said a moment ago, you know, with Grandmother Hall. And Grandmother Hall was a cold, aloof woman. Why don't you smile, Eleanor? By the way, her first name was Anna. She was baptized Anna. But she always preferred Eleanor. It sounded a little bit like Elliot, Little Nell, Little Nell from the Dickens novel, Eleanor to Elliot, Elliot to Eleanor. And why don't you smile? You never make eye contact. You always look grim. Uh, you're not your mother. I can't be, she never said this, but obviously, I can't be my mother. She had no f girlfriends. You know, she didn't socialize. And at the dances, at the, at the cotillions, you know, which was mandatory among the swells, remember that? Edith Wharton's The Swells, you know, the 400 families, that her dance card was never full, that she would be at the, you know, standing against the wall, you know, dressed up, of course, and her arms folded and watching everybody else, you know, dancing and laughing and, and swirling around the dance floor. And her dance card was never full. And it grieved her. It grieved her. And the only joy, the only pleasure that she found in life that grandmother quickly put an end to is that the Irish, you know, the Irish who did the cleaning, the Irish who did the, you know, the cooking and so forth, that they made of her, and she liked to be around the help. You know, they made of her. They made her laugh, and they made her smile. And Grandmother Hall said, Eleanor, we do not associate with the help. They're Irish. We do not associate with the help. They're not one of us. They're Irish. They don't belong here. We pay them two bucks a week, and we talk to them on Friday night when we plan the menus for the weekend. So we don't... We don't socialize. We don't talk to them. And, and, for, and, and Grandmother Hall made it clear that there's no conversation around the dinner table. Uh, there's no reading in bed at night. There's none of that. Uh, we say our prayers and go to bed. And we have cold baths. It toughens you up. And she had no girlfriends. And her whole life, Eleanor Roosevelt's entire life, was a process of, rediscover of, of discovering herself. I mean, truly, how, you know, digging deep, and, and we'll close with that in a little bit. And there were, there were three transform, transformative experiences in her life. And every once in a while, we are graced with an, with an important person in our life, a significant other. It may be a spouse. It may be a, it might be a brother or a sister. It might be a neighbor. It might be a coach. Someone who is transformational and changes things for you. And have you ever looked at it this way? Have you thought about it this way? Have you considered this? And, and the first transformational person that she met was Madame Souvestre. <coughs> now, it was the tradition among the swells, you know, that one, when one graduates from high school, that one went to a finishing school in Europe. You know, you did a year in Europe to kind of you know, burnish yourself a little bit and, and brush up your social skills, your language skills, to be able to order a wine properly and pronounce it properly. 
I always tell my girls, if you're with a guy and he orders a glass of Merlot, which will never happen, but if you're lucky enough to meet a guy who orders a glass of Merlot and he pronounces it Merlot, dump him. Dump him. Dump him. That's right there. Pretend you got a phone call. Dump him. Or, or later on in life, and I'll push him a little bit, and I'll say, you know, if you're, if you're still going with a guy and he's 27 and 28 years old and he's living at home, done. <laughs> done. Time to go, all right? Time to go. So that's the advice that I give. I give them other bits of advice, but some of it I can't repeat. Yeah. <laughs> this is a family show, and I'll always say, I'll deny it. I, I'll deny it. I'll deny it. Play me the tape. Show me the photograph. Deny, deny, deny. I always told my sons, deny, deny, deny. Don't admit to anything unless you're being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> because there's cash with that. <laughs> Madame Silverstre, you know, Eleanor went to England, and Madame Silverstre, here's a young lady in trouble. Here's a young lady in trouble. Eleanor, look at me when you talk to me. Look at me. Make eye contact. You're a beautiful woman. You've got beautiful hair. Your eyes, your eyes, they're like robin's egg blue. And you're a beautiful woman. Stop biting your nails. She had her nails right down to the cuticle, red raw. Eleanor, stop biting your nails. Look at me. Express yourself. Have a point of view, and you're as awkward as a as a as a giraffe. But every girl plays a sport. Every girl that comes to my finishing school plays a sport. And Eleanor chose to play field hockey. Now she didn't know the difference between a football and a golf ball, but playing field hockey with the girls and having friends and laughing and being part of that socialization. And Madame Souvestre, you know, we're traveling to Portugal, we're traveling to Italy, and we're going to order off the menu. You know, we're going to order off the menu in the, in the language. And, and you will learn wines, and you will learn German food, and French food, and Port Spanish food. This is part of your growth, you see. And Eleanor. And, and Eleanor's shoulders, they didn't broaden, but they, they came up. You know, and she looked people in the eye, and she had a point of view, and it, it was ter terrific. She discovered herself, you know, that I am worthy. Isn't it great when you finally wake up and you say that I matter? Mm -hmm. yeah. that, you know, and, and, and some kids never get to that, even as adults, you know, that I matter, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm worthy of being loved, you know, I'm worthy. And, and, and Eleanor strengthened in, uh, under the tutelage of Madame Souvestre. And then she met Franklin. Boy, did that change her life in many, many ways. And, and we know, don't we, you know, whatever their, and I'm jumping here a little bit, whatever their relationship was or came to be uh, to the country, they were always Mr. and Mrs. New Deal, weren't they? You know, whatever that relationship was or came to be, uh, they were related, fifth cousin, so it's okay, all right? And, and, and Franklin Roosevelt, Hey, fellow, well met. Hey, can you help me out with my glasses? <laughs> the, uh, I'm sure you do a better job than I do. She was hail fellow. He was hail fellow, well met. I always like to make the point that Franklin Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, attended Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't much of a student, you know. The gentleman's seat that he attended Harvard. But he was hail fellow well met. People liked Franklin Roosevelt. He was fun to be around. He could tell jokes. He was interesting. He was the, the, he was the life of the party, the center of attention. And one fine day, Eleanor is, is, is in the railroad car or the, or the trolley, and she hears from the back of the railroad car, Eleanor, 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 Eleanor. She's looking around. Over here, Eleanor, Eleanor. It's Cousin Franklin. It's Cousin Franklin. And were they smitten? Talk about chemistry for a while. You know, talk about chemistry. And, and Franklin went home to Mother, you know, and, 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 and Mother. And he said, I've, I've met the most delightful woman. 
and of course his mother, oh really Franklin, he was an only child, uh, and really Franklin, how droll, uh, who was this delightful woman? It's Eleanor Roosevelt, police, <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt, no one knows the way you, you, the way you like your butter, your, your, your bread toaster like you do, or your eggs done, Eleanor Roosevelt, I think not. And, and, he, and she determined, I'm going to wash that woman out of your hair. And a lot of times that doesn't work. So she took him on a cruise to the Caribbean. You know, and they had a good time, and, he, and they came back. And he hadn't forgotten about her. And boy, she had, ne had not forgotten about him. He's the most exciting, romantic man I've ever met. And he pays attention <coughs> to me. You know, we talk politics. We talk about poets. And he, he appreciates my point of view. And we have eye contact. And this guy is beautiful. Where did he come from? How did this happen? And his mother took him on a trip to wash me out of his hair? I don't think so. And, and, and by happenstance, they, they met again. And it happened to be the weekend of the Harvard-Yale football game. Now, you know you've made it when a Harvard senior invites you <coughs> to the Harvard-Yale football game. Eleanor, I'm there. I'm in. I'm a player. He invited me to the game. Now, she did not know a thing about football. <laughs> She's Eleanor Roosevelt. But Franklin was a cheerleader on the football team. You know, sis, boom, bum. Sis, boom, bum. And, and Harvard got beat 16 to 0. She didn't care. She didn't know what that meant. Because I'm watching my guy. He's on the sidelines, moving around and patting the guys on the back and leading cheers with the megaphone and so forth. And this is my guy. She's 19. He's 21. He proposes marriage. Mother, at Sarah, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You can do much, much better. You're my guy. You're my son. I've only got one son, one child. You know how that can be, all right? And there's no woman who's good enough for you. Only I am, your mother. I know how you like your pants pressed. And I know you really dislike when you have your trousers with, with the railroad tracks on them, you know? So I, and I know that. But you know how it is. Sometimes when you try to get in the way, you get pushed away, don't you? And, that, and, you, and you need to concede what you cannot defend gracefully or protect gracefully. So they married, and they married in 1905, and, and mother, Sarah, sent them off for a month on a honeymoon to Europe, and Eleanor came back expecting. Eleanor always, what a surprise, huh? <laughs> Is that supposed to happen on a honeymoon? Uh, you come back expecting? I always tell my girls something else, if you, go, if, if you get married, and you don't have to, you can just live with a guy and leave it at that, it makes it simple. Uh, and the, uh, Said, but you got to promise me one thing. If you go on a honeymoon, do not go to Disney. Please. It is a preview of what's coming. <laughs> Kids with runny nose and crying. Do not go to Disney. It's a preview. It's a forecast. And then I usually walk around the room and I'll say, I'll say to whomever, will you make, will you promise me that? I'll just say, I will promise you that. Right. Okay, thank you. Let's continue. So that's, that's what I'll say, and we'll keep right on going. And the, so she came back, and when, and when they returned, Sarah, mother, had a wonderful surprise for the newlyweds. I have a home for you. I bought a home for you, a duplex. And guess who your name is? <laughs> she had that duplex built, and she had adjoining doors, and she could walk right into it. You locked this on me. <laughs> this is one of my props. I know that one's locked too. So that mother could walk into the kitchen to direct the kitchen help and walk into the living room and, and make sure things were properly arranged. Now, at first, Eleanor accepted this. I mean, her mother was absent and she would call, you know, and she referred to her as mother, 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 but but what, it, what she would do, what Sarah would do, is that she would move furniture around. I mean, Eleanor would put a, a, a vase here, 
and, and said, well, it really belongs over here. You know, or that chair looks much better over there. And after a while, and we know how this happens, that she became absolutely suffocating, suffocating. And, he, and, she, and she didn't complain, she wasn't a complainer, but, you know, frankly, your mother is always here. You know, she's always interfering. And now she's telling the children, as the children, children came, boom, she had tough, tough pregnancies. And, and Roosevelt welcomed it, frankly. He called them my little chicks. Well, he didn't have to carry them at night and stand or deliver them. And, and now she's telling the children that, I'm, that, that your mother is really their mother, and this is all because of her, and I need some space. Oh, and Franklin, she's only trying to help. Please, Eleanor, she's only trying to help. And for Eleanor, it became suffocating. You know, it's like Sunday morning, you know, ding dong, ding dong, your in laws show up with, uh, with, with donuts and coffee. Can't we have Sunday morning alone? Why are they always here? Don't answer the door. We have to, the cars are in the driveway. <laughs> So Sarah was always present, and the only time, and, and and Eleanor found as the relationship began to develop, and you know it's like the day after you're married. Now what do we do? <laughs> now what do we do? Right? We both exchange vows. Now what happens? Now what do we do? And that's when the assignments get laid out, don't they? You know that okay? You got that job, and you got that job, and you got that job, and. and and Eleanor found out that all the jobs were hers. Franklin never paid any bills. She took care of the bills. She took care of all the correspondence. He never said birthday cards, anniversary cards, condolence, condolence cards, that she did all the paperwork. She was the secretary. She kept him scheduled. And, and he was a poor disciplinarian. A Franklin, the children are acting up. And, and, and they're being a rude and disrespectful. Oh, they're chicks. There'll be time enough to grow up. And so I'm not, he wasn't a disciplinarian. And, and she thought on Sunday morning, we're gonna go to service. We'll go to the Episcopalian service. We'll talk about the, we'll have breakfast together. You know, we'll talk about what the minister had to say. Frank, I, I got tea time at nine o'clock. <laughs> and, and, and that intimacy which she had never had as a child, and that with her parents or her grandmother, that it never developed. Franklin Roosevelt was out, and you take care of all the bills and the phone calls and whatever else needs to be done. Uh, during World War I, Eleanor Roosevelt volunteered her time to make little packages for the soldiers, the doughboys, and Woodrow Wilson, Woodrow Wilson appointed Franklin Roosevelt the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Now we all know, don't we, you know, that the Roosevelts are navalists, aren't they? Whether it's you know, Theodore and so forth, and, 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 and Franklin is still ambulatory. And, and Eleanor, Eleanor now married to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, that uh, her secretary, Lucy Mercer, you know, her soon to be Lucy uh, Rutherford. You know, her, Roosevelt began to, Franklin, that Eleanor is too much of a fuddy-duddy. You know, that everything has to be in place. You know, that we have to pay the bills. You know, that we have to make that phone call. And, and, and Lucy was much more, she was very different. A, a much more different, open, fun-loving, younger woman. And he was in contact with her all the time because this is my wife's secretary, my, her, her private secretary. And they became an item. What else can I say? And that's, and Franklin went to Europe to inspect the, the Navy in Europe during World War II. And he fell ill. You know, he, he fell ill and he came home. And, and, but he sent his suitcases home ahead of him his trunks, and Eleanor, as a very dutiful wife, well, here are his clothes, here are the suitcases, and I'll put his clothes away, because I know he's right behind the, uh, the, the cargo, the, the, the suitcases, and she found them. Yes. She found the letters from Lucy to Franklin that he had kept, and she read them. Why would you read them? 
you know it's, you're going to have a bad hair day. <laughs> Why? Why is my husband receiving letters from my private secretary? All you had to do was read the first one. Bingo, I got this figured out. Uh, something, this isn't right. And Eleanor offered divorce. And, and mother came in. You know, Sarah came in and had a sit down with Franklin. Franklin. <laughs> if you plan to have a political future, you cannot get a divorce. You'll have no political future. Um, and back then, and back then, that was the curse, wasn't it? You know, you're not going to have a political future if you you're marked. You know, you're marked as a divorced man. You're never going to have a political future. Secondly, Franklin, Franklin, she's a Catholic, and you're not, and that doesn't work. And we all remember, you know, that oftentimes, you know, that there was always a problem, a Catholic matter, uh, marrying a Protestant, a Protestant marrying a Catholic, and, and somebody had to change allegiances, didn't they? You know, you had to change your calling card. And for, and for the Catholic Church, I mean, if you marry a Protestant, you're finished. Back in the 40s and 50s, you're done, right? Can't happen. I mean, just can't, unless you convert. And whatever. She's a Catholic, frankly. And thirdly, Thirdly, my dear boy, I'm going to read you out of the will. <laughs> she has the money. No, I don't, see, you're all laughing because I know which one of the three you would have checked off as being least desirable, right? Uh, I'm going to read you out of the will. So their relationship became perfunctory. It became business. It became a business. You know, it wasn't a marriage. It became a business. And Franklin went on to to, well, at 39, he contracted polio, didn't he? And that changed everything. Compabello, and, 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 and Eleanor enjoyed going up to Compabello because Sarah oftentimes wasn't around. And to get away from your mother, she is suffocating. We all have in-law questions, don't we, sometimes? Absolutely suffocating. Do we have to invite her? You ever in a situation where we're going, we're having Thanksgiving dinner? Can we take two cars? Because at some point I've had enough you know, and I want to leave. Well, you just can't leave. I have to leave. I can take an hour, two cars, huh? and then I'm leaving. You can stay. You can stay. But I got to go. That happens, doesn't it? We all know that. Yes. We all know that, don't we? It happens. You know, you look at a wedding, a wedding, a wedding portfolio, and the, and the big question is, why are those heads cut off? <laughs> That's the interesting story, isn't it? Why are these people decapitated? <laughs> and they're at the head table. So, so that's where the story is. I mean, history is not a fairy tale, is it? And, and, and certainly, every, everybody doesn't live happily ever after. So here we have, you know, the Roosevelts. It's cool. You know, it's, it, I mean, it's cool. It's, it's a business. And, and Roosevelt contracts polio at the age of 39, Franklin. He always <laughs> thought he would walk again and that he would, you know, run along the beach with the children on his shoulders again. It never happened. Never. But Franklin Roosevelt was always convinced, I will walk again. With enough exercise and enough determination, I will walk again. And that's why he went down to, that's why he went down to Georgia, you know, all the time. And, you know, in, in, in warm springs. And, and to have his legs manipulated. And to kick as best he could at the side of the swimming pool. I will walk again. And guess who was with him at Warm Springs, Georgia? We all know that answer, don't we? A Lucy Mercer, now married, Lucy Rutherford. And when, when Eleanor had offered divorce, and, Graham, and, 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 Ma, and Sarah had said, one, two, three, he promised her, Eleanor, I will never see her again. I will never see Lucy again. He saw her all the time. And she was with him. <coughs> at the end, wasn't she? She is the last person to see him alive and the last person to see that wonderful, deep, mellifluous voice of Franklin Roosevelt, a voice made for promises, a voice when it came over the radio was so 
comforting and reassuring. And some people have wonderful television voices, radio voices, don't they? Telephone voices, you know that. And some people sound like breaking glass. <laughs> I mean, they just do. You can't help that. It's not like you can go to Home Depot and say, buy me a new voice. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. And, and do you know who set those liaisons up? Franklin Roosevelt's oldest daughter, Sarah. You know, she worked behind the scenes to set up those liaisons to make sure Lucy was at Warm Springs when my father was there, because Eleanor was always traveling. Eleanor Roosevelt, well, I'm going to jump just a little bit, then I'm going to come back to Earl Miller, the most manly man she ever met, Earl Miller. Then Eleanor Roosevelt, her nickname when she was First Lady, continuing for the next more than a dozen years, her nickname was Eleanor Eleanor everywhere. She was always, she traveled over 200 days a year. And, 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 and many of the socialites condemned her for that. Why aren't you home with your children? You have a husband who's in a wheelchair. He needs your help. Why do you have five children? Eleanor was a terrible mother. A terrible mother. But she was a wonderful grandmother. Because now it's once removed and she had a gym set up on the third floor of the White House, you know, swing sets on the, on the South Lawn. A terrific grandmother. In fact, the, the Roosevelt, I haven't lost my way, the Roosevelt children, five children, among those five children, there were 21 divorces. Now that speaks for itself in terms of watching mom and dad get along, doesn't it? And can you imagine, speaking about Thanksgiving, you know, everybody had her name tag. Now, who's your mother? Now, your father is where? And, okay, over there. So, I mean, it was a confused, confused personal life. Eleanor everywhere. Stealing a phrase from, from J. Edgar Hoover, Eleanor Roosevelt, the press, she's public energy number one. Go, go, go. Keep busy. And, and many of the newspapers that you should be home with your children. You should be home with your husband. That's not Eleanor Roosevelt. She was not a soccer mom. I've got to be out there. I've got to do stuff. I have to make a difference. I need to help people. And the point I wanted to make with Franklin contracting polio, and I've always made this connection, and I want to make it with you. I think, I know, I don't think, I know that polio deepened Franklin Roosevelt. And that's why he was so responsive to, to the problems of the Great Depression. It deepened him. It deepened him in this way. And this is something else that's always true. There are very, very few things that are always true. This is always true. And I know it's true of some people in this room as well. And here's, here's the truth. Bad things happen to good people all the time, don't they? You didn't deserve it. You, know, you didn't go looking for it. It caught up with you. Bad things happen to good people all the time. Theodore Roosevelt knew that. And Theodore Roosevelt gave Eleanor away at the marriage. And Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, always talked about black care. That in your life, you're always in the saddle. Ride hard. Ride swiftly. All right? Black care. Something is gaining on you. And just keep moving, moving, moving. Because bad things happen to good people all the time. And you know that, Eleanor. And you know that from your childhood. And you know that from what happened to your wonderful husband. Black care. Keep moving. So, and she kept moving. Public energy, number one. I don't get the black care. What's that mean? It means there's something gaining on you. Uh -huh. Something gaining on you. Uh, did you ever read the short stories, uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes? Ray Bradbury, I think. Uh -huh. you know, the, the, uh, the, the circus coming into town. Yeah. Read that short story. Uh -huh. Something Wicked This Way Comes. And you think it's fun. But Ray Bradbury is dark. Uh -huh. And that circus brought dark people uh -huh. and dark experience. Something's gaining on you. And and, and, and we know that. I mean, we all, you're wearing black today. <laughs> you got the memo? <laughs> you're reading my mail, right? <laughs> or maybe I'm reading your mail. <laughs> Keep in touch. All right? As governor, Roosevelt's in a wheelchair, and, and Sarah wants, Franklin, uh, you, you, 
a governor, a politician with those kinds of people that are involved in politics? And she, and she said, come to Hyde Park and, and bring your wife and bring your children and I will take care of you. I will look out for you. And this is where Eleanor broke with, with Sarah. He's my husband. We are not going home to your home where you will nurse him and baby him. He is my husband. We're not going back to Hyde Park. And Eleanor was very firm about that. And also, she enjoyed being the wife of the governor. She loved the politics. Really enjoyed it, going to the meetings and so <coughs> forth, and reading the reports and listening to the debate. And she met the third most significant person in her life, the significant other. And that was the head of her security detail. And, and, and that was Earl Miller. Um, and I'm not suggesting anything untoward here, but they, they became fast friends, and he was part of her maturation. He taught Eleanor how to drive a car. Mm -hmm. He taught her how to, how, to ha how to load and fire a pistol. Not too well, I'll come back to that. <laughs> he, told her how to he taught her how to shoot pool, how to play, how to play poker, and how to ride a horse. That was a whole different range of experiences. And there's a wonderful PBS video on Eleanor Roosevelt. And before the New Deal built up all of Washington, you know, there she is on the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue with one of her lady friends, Lorena Hickok, and they're riding. You know, they're simply riding. Roosevelt could never ride, obviously. Well, he could, but he didn't, didn't have time. And Earl Miller taught her a whole new range of abilities, of, of things to do, a sense of accomplishment. She enjoyed being First Lady of New York. And in 1932, you know, the very worst year of the Depression, the very, very worst year of the Depression, in 1932, Franklin Roosevelt, you know, put his hands up to be elected, didn't he? To, you know, to seek the Democratic nomination. Eleanor wasn't pleased about that at all. She liked New York. You know, she liked working socially and politically in New York. And this is brand new. And I don't want all the attention to being a first lady. I mean, she knew what that meant. And, you know, Franklin Roosevelt going to the convention, and Eleanor was there, and Roosevelt accepting the nomination of the, of the Democratic Party. And for the very first time in political history, the candidate who was nominated was there at the convention to accept the nomination in person. You see, traditionally what would happen, you would be, it was in Chicago, you know, the convention in Chicago. And you would be there, but you'd, better, you'd be at an, a hotel downtown. And if you were nominated, the party would come to you and say you've been nominated, and then you went through the drill. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, it <laughs> still my heart. What an honor. My mother will be so proud of me. It's 1932 the very worst year of the Depression. And Roosevelt, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to walk, and I'm going to accept the nomination in person on my feet. And when Roosevelt had to walk, he did it with, 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 with the smoke and mirrors. When he had to walk, he could walk, couldn't he? Mm -hmm. Helped by his sons, and later on by the Secret Service. He had 10 pounds of steel on each leg. He couldn't move his legs. His legs had, a tw had were the size of my forearms with atrophy. But when he had to walk to be, and he had a strong upper body because he worked out, and to be lifted, and he would leverage himself on his son's arms or on the Secret Service, and then, and then kick my heels, mm -hmm. kick my heels and move me, not too quickly. I can do 10 steps to the podium and make sure the podium is nailed. Because if it's on a, ro if it's on a roller, or it's not nailed, I'm going to keep right on going. All right? And I want to address the nation. I want to speak to the country in the summer of 1932. And Roosevelt to Eleanor and to his closest aides, you know, this, this depression, all these economic problems, he said, we can fix these. You know, these are human problems. And then he would add carefully, Eleanor or whomever he was speaking to, if you have spent every night in bed trying to wiggle your big toe, which you couldn't do, you know, these are, these are human problems. We can solve them. Do you know the name John Maynard Keynes? Does that, 
mean anything to you. John Maynard Keynes, you know, the British economist, deficit spending, the government needs to spend its way out of a depression. Only they have the financial resources to jumpstart the economy. Now, 1932, the very worst year of the depression, and Roosevelt, bad things happen to good people, but John Maynard Keynes, who was a renowned, world-known economist, like years ago, you might know the name John Kenneth Galbraith, the Affluent mm -hmm. Society, Keynes was asked, the Depression was global, and Keynes was asked, has there ever been a time such as this before? And he paused for a moment. He said, yes, there has been. And it lasted 400 years. It was called the Middle Ages. And that's what Roosevelt is walking into. And at that convention, and Eleanor was there, and look at the, look at the film. I mean, she's rubbing her hands. She's anxious. Can I, can I be first lady? really in the public spotlight. This is so new. I know the ground rules in New York. And Roosevelt, that great voice, he went, went out across a suffering nation, and people listening, and their ears to their Emersons, their, their RCAs, their, their Philco radios, and Roosevelt, that you have not failed. This Republican administration has failed you. Hoover, you have not failed. I have your interests at heart. The time of waiting is over. And if you gift me, I like, I like that expression, if you gift me with your vote, I will, I will mobilize the powers of the federal government in ways in which it has never been mobilized before. I promise you here tonight, and I promise the nation, a new deal. He had no idea what it meant. <laughs> but it was a great line that a speechwriter had put in the speech and everybody wanted to ask him, well, Governor Roosevelt, Governor Roosevelt, what do you mean by a new deal? He didn't know. <coughs> well, I'll tell you what I mean by a new deal. I'll tell you. I mean, I don't know. Sam, Sam wrote the speech. What do we mean by a new deal? I don't know. I thought it sounded great. Well, if everybody's asking me, but we all know it was jobs, jobs, jobs. And, and, here's Eleanor, and, and here's Eleanor Roosevelt at the inaugural, the first of four, and you see her. Her eyes are down, and she's, you know, rubbing her hands. What does all of this mean? And, and we know that signature line, don't we? What's the only thing we have to fear? Fear itself, right? We ought to be afraid of being afraid. We can solve these. These are economic problems. These are solvable problems. And together. And Roosevelt always used plurals, Pro us, we, together. This is our problem, and it's my problem and your problem, and together we can work this out. And that, and that voice, those fireside chats, you know, going out all, all over the radio, and Eleanor, Eleanor now, public energy number one, <laughs> public energy number one, Eleanor Roosevelt, Eleanor everywhere, and she became for Franklin, and she wanted to be his eyes and ears and report. And Eleanor, love of my life, dear, your name is engraved on my heart. He never said that. <laughs> he never said that. But you are my eyes and ears, and you're my reporter. And what, and what he wanted from her is that how are the people looking physically? You know, are there, is their skin pallor? Are they walking slouched? Or with my New Deal programs, Food programs, employment programs. Tell me, what does the laundry look like on the line? Is it all matted and dark? Is it all you know, cut up and, and repaired? And what are they serving in the soup kitchens? And there's one memorable occasion where Eleanor brought, brought home a menu from a soup kitchen. And Franklin said, Eleanor, this is the menu. Did you go in the kitchen and, and, and lift, the, and lift the, the, uh, you know, the, the top of the pot? And take a sip. No, you have to do that. This is what they this is what they say. I want you to go into the kitchen and taste it. Eleanor everywhere. There's a wonderful photograph of her. It's a cartoon. And I think it was on the cover of maybe the Atlantic or the New Republic, I don't remember. And there are there are two miners, you know, three or four miles down working a face of coal. And they've got the hard hat on and the light, and you know, they're working a face of coal. Boom. Boom. And one guy looks back over his shoulder. And there's a light coming down. And he turns to, his, to the guy he's working with, 
And he said, that's Alan Roosevelt. <laughs> now, she wasn't at the bottom of the mine, but she was at the, the entrance of the mine talking to the miners about how things are going. It's Eleanor Roosevelt. She was everywhere. The Secret Service was concerned about her safety, because she was not. She preferred her privacy over her safety. And she'd be riding around Washington, D.C., or in West Virginia with her little blue coupe, you know, with the, it was a convertible, a roadster, and driving around with a, uh, uh, Hickey, Hick, who was her first lady friend, and others followed, of course. Uh, Eleanor gave press conferences open to women reporters only. She gave radio addresses. She had uh, her own column, her own byline in, in newspapers and magazines. She was Eleanor everywhere. She, one of her sponsors when TV came was, uh, what was it, um, not, not, what, what was that margarine? Lucky, help me out here. Zaggy, Lucky, Lucky, Zaggy. No, 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 it, it'll come to me. And, and, when, and when, she was, when she sponsored things, she never kept the money and went to charities. I mean, that's Eleanor Roosevelt. And so she's driving around as if she has no enemies. And J. Edgar Hoover, you know, went to Franklin Roosevelt. It's a wonderful letter. And he sent, he sent Roosevelt a letter. One of the letters said, if there's one woman who ought not have a pistol, it's your wife. <laughs> with all due respect. Now, how did he know that? Because she would go down to the FBI firing range and have target practice, and all the guys would back up. <laughs> <laughs> and that, here, is, here is J. Edgar Hoover, a letter to the president. She ought not have a pistol. <laughs> and the other letter was, in, 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 in a more security sense, she drives around Washington, D.C., with, with the top down, you know, with her lady friends, as if she's an average citizen. She needs secret service protection. And so Franklin and Eleanor had a sit down and he explained to her, you know, this the you know about the problem, you know, that the uh, you know the, the, the Secret Service had with her lack of protection. And and he, and she said, I don't want protection. I want my privacy, not protection. But I'll tell you what I will do, Franklin. You know, she spoke like that. Franklin. <laughs> she, she had a voice. She lost control of her voice all the time, didn't she? When she got excitable, she had a voice coach, Lewis Howe, that she brought from New York. He would say, Mrs. Franklin, when you speak, when, when you, Mrs. Roosevelt, rather, when you speak, get up, say what you have to say, and sit down. <laughs> because when you become excitable and become spontaneous, you lose control of your voice. It goes off like a honking goose, you know, coming out of a swamp. <laughs> Sit down, say what you have to say, and be done with it. So she has this conversation with Franklin. I don't want, I don't want protection, but I'll tell you what I will do. I'll keep the pistol in the glove box. <laughs> but that's not the end of the story. She had the last laugh. She never loaded it. <laughs> I want my privacy. Well, that would never happen today, would it? Uh, it never happened today. And, and in 1936, the, the New Deal was re-elected, and the, not, that 1936 election was a stunning victory for the New Deal. That the, the New Deal, and I'm saying the Roosevelt's here, in the 1936 election, with Roosevelt up for re-election, it was a stunning victory. The, the New Deal carried every state in the Union, except two. That's four, except two. <laughs> Maine and Vermont. There are more cows yeah. than voters in Maine and Vermont. That victory, as I came, as I came in over the radio, you know, being, being called by the, by the reporters over the radio, Ohio goes for the New Deal, Massachusetts for Roosevelt, Connecticut for Roosevelt, California for Roosevelt, and Franklin, Sitting back, he always had that cigar going, didn't he? Mm -hmm. That with you know, and, and it sucked the very oxygen out of his lungs. We carried every state, but Maine and Vermont. The good people of New Hampshire were so embarrassed <laughs> that Maine and Vermont had not supported the New Deal. I can't make this up. It's a great story. That on the roads and bridges leading from New Hampshire into Maine and Vermont, they erected enormous signs, and the signs read. You are now leaving. 
the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Is that right? The New Deal is in the Senate. And not only and not only the New Deal, but the Democrats Democrats wound up with 75% majorities in both the House and the Senate. What an endorsement for the New Deal. You know, we put the country to work. And I told you the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. We can fix this. We can do this. Us, we together. Don't be afraid. Hold your heart and jump with me. I'm your guy. And you elected me once, you've elected me twice, you're going to elect me a third time and a fourth time. And, and, and for Franklin Roosevelt, I'm the guy. You know, I'm your guy. I'm, I'm, you know, vote for me once, you'll never go out with another guy again. I'm your guy. Once, twice, three times, four times. You met the real deal. You met the New Deal. I put this country back to work. And thank you, Eleanor, for traveling and traveling and traveling. You know, in 1940, the Roosevelt's were ready to go home. And Eleanor's packing. Not the letters. But Eleanor's, <laughs> Eleanor's packing. I wonder whatever became of those. Yeah. Eleanor's packing to go home. Two terms and we're done. Now, there's no ter two term limit yet. And then there's a knock on the door. Oh. Will this work? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. President, it opened! Oh. <laughs> How did that happen? How did you do that? <laughs> you locked this. I saw you lock it. I need more chair if you have to be See, it's all in the figures. <laughs> Gotta play, I gotta play the slot somewhere, right? It's all in the fingertips. It's all in the touch. We know you're in there. And and they approached Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor. Now, Mr. President, don't call me that. I'm going home. Will you will you campaign? Will you accept the nomination for a, for a third term? And he and he and Eleanor, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Two terms and we're gone. We're going home. I'm tired. My wife is tired. We're exhausted. And then the leaders of the Democratic Party changed the question. And this changed everything. If you are nominated, will you accept the nomination? I told you, I'm not going to the convention. We didn't ask you that. If you are nominated, will you accept a third term? It's 1940. The war is coming. Europe's at war. Asia's at war. The war is coming. And Roosevelt knew that. Roosevelt was a sailor. He knew that. The barometer was dropping. The, the clouds were coming right down on the deck. The waves were rolling across the Atlantic and the Pacific and the wind lifting the waves and white caps shooting off from the, the heads of the top of the wave. It's coming. And there will be a no safe, no safe port now. We can't hide behind our oceans. It's coming. I will accept the nomination. But I'm not going. Eleanor, love of my life. <laughs> Eleanor, my dear, will you go to the convention and accept the nomination for me? I thought we were going home. I know, I know, I know. And she's the first woman ever to address a national convention. And they, want the, they want the old man there. They want a roar. For, they want a roar for, for, the, for the lion. They want a roar for FDR. And Eleanor was there. And, and by the way, dear, when you go to the convention, I want, I want a new vice president. Can you do some arm twisting and get Henry Wallace on the ticket? What? I have to go there and get the nomination for you? And now you want me to get you a new vice president? This never ends. That's Eleanor Roosevelt, public energy number one. And when she ran again, when the Roosevelt's, when they ran, when they ran against the, the Republicans, that the Republicans had a little badge they wore about, and, and, they, and the Republican Party, they, they talked about, you know, the third term president, you know, the third term president, the third term president, and, and, and not mentioning Roosevelt's name. He's breaking the tradition of two terms and you're gone. And then over here, third term president, no. And over here, and we don't want Eleanor either. <laughs> Talk about being the center of attention, right? This is Wendell Wilkie. They won in 40. 
They won again in 44. And Eleanor in 1943, representing the, the, well, the, uh, the Red Cross, she, she said, I want to visit the troops. I want to visit the troops in Asia. The, Europe is getting all the attention. I want to visit the troops in Asia. And, and maybe some, next year, next year, 2020, I always say this, next year, 2020, is the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. And it doesn't, and, and, and I'd like to be able to post hole in several times with, at the 75th anniversary at the end of World War II. It doesn't work to talk about it in, at the 76th anniversary or the 74th anniversary. So that's something to think about. Okay, you can write it down. Thank you. I need somebody to keep me focused. <laughs> LBJ did. Oh boy, did did. Uh, Lady Bird always put everything off for him: your shoes, your socks, <laughs> your lighter, your cigarettes, to press your handkerchief. Everything is laid out for you. Thank you, Lady Bird. Remember, she was right. everything. He, every, everything was LBJ, wasn't it? Lady Bird Johnson, Lucy, and so forth. Franklin, I'd like to visit the troops in, Japan, in, in Asia. And Franklin, and she, boy, she wouldn't let go on this. She really was his hair shirt. Uh, she was really adamant on this because the, the, the European war received more money, more attention, you know, than the, than the Asian war. And you may remember that. And so Roosevelt calls up, uh, calls up George Marshall and says, you know, my, she always called it my, he said, my, my missus. Men don't call their wives missus anymore. You know, Roosevelt always said, my missus tells me. Uh, you know, if you were Winston Churchill, the way he would describe Eleanor Roosevelt, a woman who does not know her place. <laughs> That's West Winston Churchill. She's always around. A woman who does not know his place. For Roosevelt, my missus tells me. Well, for, for J. Edgar Hoover, she ought not have a pistol. <laughs> And also that she's a pinko. Remember that phrase from the Red Scare? Her, she's so lefty, she's a pinko. When Eleanor Roosevelt stayed at hotels, the FBI would bug her room. And, and, one, and one time, the, the, the hotel personnel told Eleanor, the FBI's here, and they bugged everything. They bugged the plants. They bugged everything. They're listening in on every conversation. She blew her stack, and I'm sure it was more than oh spinach. <laughs> and she called Franklin, and Franklin, he didn't. I, I don't need this. No, I, don't, I don't need this, man. She's really blown her top. So he called J. Edgar Hoover, and he said, "I don't know who did this. Get the bugs out of my wife's bedroom, out of the hotel room. She knows she's being bugged. Are you bugging her? <laughs> yes, because she has lefty friends. Stop it." This is the beginning of the Red Scare after World War II. Mm -hmm. So Eleanor, El El I want to visit the troops. Roosevelt calls up Marshall. Marshall says, I'll get back to you, Mr. President. And he ought to. Roosevelt's the commander-in-chief. <laughs> you always want to return the phone call to the commander-in-chief if he signs your paycheck. So he calls back and he says, Mr. President, I'm sorry, it can't be done. The admirals and the, the, admirals and the generals out there don't want no part want no part of protecting the First Lady. So, thank you. Eleanor comes in. They said, no, unacceptable. <laughs> unacceptable. I'm going. I'm going. Marshall, she wants to go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Eleanor traveled to the Pacific, and she asked for no favors. She flew commercial. She only took 40 pounds of luggage, which is what reporters brought, and she was gone for three, three and a half weeks. She covered 23,000 miles. I'll bet she enjoyed this. She lost 30 pounds. She came down two dress sizes. Hey, Eleanor. <laughs> I can see it. Something I would do. A guy's a guy, right? You can't help the DNA. It's there. It's running to high tide. And when she returned, and you know, she didn't go for the for photo ops. She went to the wards. 
and she moved from war to war to war, and sitting on the edge of the bed of a wounded airman, Navy, Marine, Army, and looking at the chart, you're going home, son. You're on the mend. you're going home. I've been talking to the doctors, you're going home. And on behalf of my husband and myself in a grateful nation, thank you. Thank you for serving. And for these young men, 18, 19, 20, this is like my mother sitting on the edge of the bed with that soft voice, her hair pulled back, those beautiful blue eyes, and talking softly. You're on the mend. Thank you. You're going home. Where you from, son? I'll write your mother. She wrote every one of those letters. She had, she, she responded to a thousand letters a month. And I'm, I will write to your mother. You're on the mend. I saw you. Where are you from, son? And that's Eleanor. And when she returned after two and a half or three weeks, the admirals and the generals, when she coming back? When she coming back? She was such a morale booster. When she coming back? Well, she never went back. But the point is that she went. You know, Eleanor everywhere. And, you know, Franklin Roosevelt, you know, never, see Franklin Roosevelt, and I, you know, I, I did some, I, I did my, you can tell, I'm a Roosevelt guy, mm -hmm. you know, that I did my PhD on Franklin Roosevelt. I never told my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> she was a Republican. <laughs> Don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> she was very proud that I earned my doctorate and said, your mother, if she were here, would be very proud as well, but she never asked. <laughs> and I didn't tell her, because I know I would hear her hit the floor. <laughs> then I'm out of the will. <laughs> there were only two of us in the will. And I don't want to jeopardize that. Right? So she didn't ask and I didn't tell. You know, when you go to the Roosevelt Library, and I know I'm watching the clock, all right, I know what time it is. When one goes to the Roosevelt Library and you tour, it's a wonderful take. It's a wonderful take. And you put the headphones on, it's Eleanor Roosevelt's voice. I mean, she died in November, November 7th, 1962, of aplastic anemia. But it's her voice in your ear, modulated, walking you through. And it's like they're there. And with a little bit of an imagination, they're there, they're there, they're there, they're all there. And, you know, you read Roosevelt's letters. Roosevelt was not a religious man, nor, would, nor did he keep a diary, but he kept notes. He had a wonderful stamp collection, and that gave him pleasure, the stamp collection. And, 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 and thinking out loud in his notes, in little jottings, asking the Lord, give me enough breath Give me enough life so I live long enough to see victory in Europe and in Asia. Then take me. And Roosevelt, by 1945, was dying. You know, he knew that. You know, looking in the mirror, the gully face, the cadaverous looks, his blood pressure. I always like to drop just this one detail in. His blood pressure was 240 over 130, and that's on medication. Wow. And he knew he was dying. Give me, please, Lord. Give me enough life, enough breath to see victory. Didn't happen, did it? You know, sometimes the Lord doesn't pick up the phone. Sometimes he's busy. Huh? Or there's a busy signal. And so Roosevelt died in April of 45. Harry Truman wraps up the war. But Roosevelt died at Warm Springs, and Lucy Rutherford was with him. And she was having his portrait done. And Anna had made the liaison again, as I we started at the very beginning. You know, he's sitting there, and the portrait, the portrait painting, portrait, portraiture guy is doing it, and, and and Lucy's there, and they're chatting, they're chatting, and and the last thing anyone heard him say, or she heard him say, is that he paused for a moment and took his fingers and he said, "Oh, put them to his temple. It hurts." Mm -hmm. Oh, it hurts. He had a massive cerebral hemorrhage. And he died shortly after that. And Eleanor came down. And that's when she found out that Anna had been arranging these trysts for years and years and years. And that's when she came down and found out that Lucy was with him the moment he died. And as the physician, the attending physician remembered, that Eleanor went in the bedroom where the, where the president's body was resting 
and remained in there for 30 minutes and sat on the edge of the bed. And one can only imagine, you know, what was going through her mind. Huh? Betrayal, betrayal, betrayal. After all we've done together. But she was so strong and so brave and so resilient. And that's the sign of maturity, to be resilient, to get up and move, to be resilient, shake it off, come to grips with it, deal with it, manage it, cope with it. You can use whatever verb you want. And as she accompanied her body back to Washington, D.C., and as that train rattled through the night and rattled through the day, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people, you know, standing, standing by the, uh, standing on, on, alongside the railroad tracks or on the platforms or, or at the crossing guards, you know, where, you know, ding, 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 and standing and, and, and waving, saluting, <laughs> weeping, hands over their heart. And as she looked at that sea of faces, she came to realize that I only had a part of this guy. He belonged to the country. He belonged to the country. And she was able to deal with that and in her own inimitable way, mature way. And when Franklin was waked and then buried it up in Hyde Park, you know, she was asked, what's the inscription? What's the slogan? The epitaph. I have my epitaph picked up, mm -hmm. uh, ready to go. The epitaph. And so there's only one phrase that sums up my husband. You know where I'm going. Mm -hmm. The only thing we have to fear mm -hmm. is fear mm -hmm. itself. That's my husband. And the world grieved. The soldiers wept. <coughs> Harry who? <laughs> Harry who? And when Roosevelt liked, you see, it was the custom of the newspapers to list the war dead alphabetically. And he would have enjoyed, I'm one of the guys, I did my duty. I did my duty as the Lord gave me enough light and strength and courage to do my duty. I died at my post. I did not deserve, desert my post. I served that third and fourth term. I died at my post. And he would have liked this. They listed the war dead. And as you run down the alphabet, there it was. Roosevelt. Roosevelt, Delano, Franklin Delano. He would have, and, and not captain, not private. Commander-in-Chief, I died at my post. I did my duty. And Eleanor understood that. And Harry Truman appointed Eleanor Roosevelt, the first, deli first American ambassador to the UN. Mm -hmm. Eleanor Roosevelt, such a friend of Israel, such a friend of the NAACP, such a friend of those in Guam, voted 11 times, Eleanor vo voted 11 times the most admired woman in the world. 11 times. And as she lay dying in November of 1962, and it came fast, see, Eleanor was asked, how do you get all your energy? Where do you find all that energy? You, you go, 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 go. And she, you know what the trick is? Take power naps. You know, take a quick 20 minute or 15 minute power nap. Recharge, refresh. When I do that, I don't get up till daybreak. <laughs> so that's an acquired skill. Right? And and, and as she began to fail, and, and, the, and people knew she was failing, aplastic anemia, you know, which is cancer of the blood cells. And she was asked by a young cub reporter, you know, Mrs. Roosevelt, what has given you the greatest pleasure? As First Lady, what has given you the greatest pleasure? And she paused for a moment, and she reflected deeply, and she said, what's given me the greatest pleasure? As she said, the privilege the privilege of being useful, the privilege of being useful, that I was in a position where I could help. And that's a wonderful way to close it out, isn't it? The privilege of being useful. I had the opportunity, I knew it, and it was Madame Souvestre who took me out of my funk. Right? <laughs> we know that, right? Look at me, Eleanor. You're a beautiful young girl. Speak to me, stop biting your nails, and you're gonna play field hockey. So there we have it this morning, and the next time I would tell the story about Eleanor Roosevelt, it might just come out differently. I'm going to spin it out a little differently. But in the main, in the greatest of the first ladies, absolutely, and the bar has been raised so high that um, I don't think anybody's going to be able to get over that bar. So before we leave, and it's not raining yet, 
Mm. Maybe a question that I can help you with the memory. You know, people, every once in a while I meet somebody, it doesn't happen as often as it used to, you know, who met Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say, describe it to her. So she was the most gentle, soft spoken woman. And when she sat down, and this is body language, that she leaned into you. Mm. Her elbows were on her kneecaps, and she leaned into you as if she were having the most important conversation that she ever had in her life. And, I, and I've heard that repeatedly, mm -hmm. you know, that she would listen and leaned into you. And that's Eleanor Roosevelt. And, sir? Did she continue to have a good relationship with her daughter? No. <laughs> um, don't you think that might be a little strained? <laughs> a little. I would. I would. You did what? <laughs> yeah, that was a bit strained. Makes sense to me, does it? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, uh, Frank and Donald would have used the atomic bomb? Oh, geez. Where, where did that come from? Uh, yes, I do. The question was, would Roosevelt have used the atomic bomb? I say yes on the Japanese. The only question is, would he have used it on the Germans? And I say yes again, because wars in their destructive power become incremental, don't they? You know, and that bomb was there, ready to go to end the war. We didn't need it in May, but we ended the war. And uh, we'll do that next year again, a little bit about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And boy, that's a great story, isn't it? And right up the street here, Chuck Sweeney, the box car, and dropping the bomb on Nagasaki. On Nagasaki. I said, yeah. What um, did President Eisenhower um, do for her? I recall that he didn't appoint her to something, some post. I'm not familiar with Ike. I'm not familiar with that. I know what he did for Kay Summersby. <laughs> I know it wasn't, but that's my answer. <laughs> it's a guy thing. It happens. It's a guy thing. The devil may be doing it. Have you been to the Washington team, Jane Lee, and wonderful um, tributes they have for Eleanor? Eleanor sure, and Franklin, yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And you know, speaking of Eleanor in Washington, D.C., that she was such a friend of the NAACP, and Marion Anderson, you know, was going to speak and, 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 and to perform as a vocalist. And, the, and the, the, the Daughters of the American Revolution refused to allow Marion Anderson to perform at their convention hall or whatever. And Eleanor, absolutely. I'm not going to accept that. So she called up Harold Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior, said, do you have another venue? And he said, how about the Lincoln Memorial? <laughs> Perfect, huh? Perfect. And whenever Eleanor was in the, can I have that chair? You can have your hat back? You need a new hat, by the way. <laughs> Just tell me. Right. It's what I do for a living. I recommend to that um, Eleanor, when she was in the South, it was all segregated seating. So blacks were on one side, whites on the others, and she would deliberately take her chair and place it in the middle aisle. That mm -hmm. I'm going to sit in between. I'm not going to be part of segregated seating here. And when the DAR refused to allow Mar Marian Anderson to perform, she resigned as a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. I don't want any part of this. That's Eleanor Roosevelt, open, growing her life, a continuous process of self discovery and learning about herself and as we said so long ago that good things bad things happen to good people all the time see these men I visited mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.